Okay, let's bring chapter six to a conclusion here. We're on slide number 42 of how to read the Bible for all it's worth. Um, some specific principles in matters of Christian experience and even more so of Christian practice, biblical precedents may be sometimes regarded as repeatable patterns, even if they're not understood to be normative, okay? For many practices, there seems to be a full justification for the later church's repeating of biblical patterns. But it is moot to argue that all Christians in every place and every time must repeat, repeat the pattern or they are disobedient to God's word. That's where we gotta be real careful, okay? Um, this is especially true when the practice itself is mandatory but the mode is not, okay? Be baptized, mandatory, mode, not, okay? Keep those two distinct, okay? The practice, yes, we're supposed to do it, okay? The mode, frequency, again, communion, um, every week, once a month, a couple times a year, okay? Um, don't make the minor a major, you know? Because the other problem of making a minor a major is, I mean, besides misreading the scriptures, is it, it creates perhaps undue division in the body of Christ, okay? Um, the decision as to whether certain practices or patterns are repeatable should be guided by the following considerations, okay? Um, first of all, again, this is slide 43, the strongest possible case can be made when only one pattern is found and when that pattern is repeated in the New Testament itself. Makes sense. Second, when there is an ambiguity of patterns or when a pattern occurs once, it is repeatable for later Christians only if it appears to have divine approval and is in harmony with where it's taught elsewhere in the scripture. Again, corroborating evidence, the importance of that. Third, what is culturally conditioned is either not repeatable at all or must be translated into new or differing culture. Again, remember, if something's culturally conditioned, it's stuck there in that first century. The only way you bring it to the to the 21st century is you've got it. You've got to translate it and 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 make it somehow, some way, applicable to today. You cannot impose the first century culture on on today. Okay, morally, yes, because that's transhistorical um, and and transcultural. It's true for all time. All right. Um, and so, so they conclude on, on slide number 44. Thus, on the basis of these principles, one can make a very strong case for immersion as the mode of baptism, a weaker case for the observance of the Lord's Supper each Sunday, but almost no case at all for infant baptism. Okay, so, so you know, I, I, this is a great chapter. Again, this is something, because again, so many of us as, in particular, Pentecostal Christians, we're all looking for the restitution of all things. We, we wanna see the church restored in all of its glory and all of its power, in particular in the face of a secular culture that is so resistant to the gospel, of course we do. But we've gotta be careful that we make everything in the book of Acts um, applicable to today exactly like they did it because that was not Luke's intent. Again, you have, I, I cannot stress this strong enough. You, we've got to go back to the original intent uh, as, as the place of control as we move forward interpreting the scriptures. And what was true in earlier chapters we talked about, it's definitely true in the book of Acts. So hopefully that's helpful to you. And um, hopefully this was a, an enriching study of the book of Acts. God bless you. I'll talk to you soon on chapter seven.